The Oilers just took a commanding 3-1 series lead. My allergies are bothering me so bad my eyes are tearing up. Let's get to work, Oilers fans. You are Locked On Oilers, your daily podcast on the Edmonton Oilers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very early Monday morning edition of Locked On Oilers. I am your interim host, Nick Sararis. Thank you for making Locked On Oilers your first listen of the week on this Monday morning. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and it's a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. Join your friends, download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. Today's episode, real straightforward. We're going to go through the key takeaways from game number three. We're going to take it big picture. We're going to go a little more closer in depth, talking about the game itself. Stuart Skinner, we salute you. We thank you. And then we're going to wrap up with three stars of the game. Real simple. If the Oilers are going to be able to win games one nothing, I think a lot of the concerns people, including myself, had last week about this series and the Oilers' fortunes in the playoffs. Not as pressing? And look, you don't want to have to win your hockey games one nothing. That's a really extreme outcome that doesn't happen all that often, regardless of how good your goalie is. Like Even if you're Shesterkin, if you're UC Soros, if you're Thatcher Demko, Vasilevsky, Bobrovsky, Swayman, you know, whichever goalie you like, It's hard to only concede a donut in today's league. You heard me talk about it on the Thursday of the first show, the second show I did uh, on the Locked on Oilers feed, where goal scoring has never been higher than it is the last couple of seasons. The three highest scoring seasons in the history of the NHL are the last three full 82 game seasons. So to win a game one nothing shows you a few things. Number one, it shows you that your goalie can on occasion rise to a level necessary and commiserate with playoff success. There's been a lot of conjecture, me included. I I talked quite a bit about Stuart Skinner going into game three. That It wasn't necessarily that he wasn't equipped or didn't have the ability to do it, but that he hadn't done it yet and it required him to find that level of comfort in his game to be able to perform at this level. And it's complicated because when we talk about goaltending, and I'm going to go a little bit more in depth on goaltending in the second segment, so I don't want to go too deep on it right now when we're talking about the game at large. In the postseason, you're going to have to find a way to win a variety of games. You heard me talk about on the Saturday episode that came out after game three, this idea that the, the Oilers in the two games they won, they scored seven and six goals, and then the other one they lost, they had scored five. And they won a game where they only scored one goal. It was an Evan Bouchard goal, which it doesn't really matter who scored it. You found a way to win. Having the ability and the resources to find a way to win this type of game, it bodes well for the Oilers, both both for a confidence and comfort feeling for the actual guys on the team and for a understanding where they're at. I think the biggest mistake I I make, at least as an evaluator when we're in the NHL playoffs, I become guilty of taking what I'm seeing too deep that I, I look for things that aren't there in a handful of sequences. You know, this game, still be going right now if Evan Bouchard didn't score that goal and that's not a critique of the Oilers or the Kings I thought the Kings played a really good game in all honesty if you go back you watch the highlights you go look at the underlying numbers I mean the Darnell Nurse Cody CC period got out 35 to 6 at 5 on 5 just egregious egregious lack of puck movement I thought the Oilers in their own zone in particular tonight really had a hard time moving the puck, getting it where it needed to be, and they just didn't look particularly comfortable. The Kings did a really nice job in transition of slowing it down, 
forcing the Oilers to play a little more structured and not as open-ended. And as the game went along, you started to see the effects of this series. I genuinely felt that by the end, by about five, six minutes to go in the third period during one of the stoppages there after a Stuart Skinner save, it really felt like the Kings were starting to run out of gas because of how hard they were playing. And uh, to some degree, I wouldn't be surprised if on some level it was tied to a glimmer of frustration, a hint of frustration on their part, because they played a really good game tonight. You go look at the box score. If you if you're if you're a sicko, go look at the deserve o meter, the deserve to win o meter on Money Puck, and it's probably going to tell you the Kings deserve to win an egregious number of times. Hang on, out of curiosity, I'm going to pull it up and see what it says about how that game went. One nothing. Where's yeah the the deserve o meter on Money Puck has it at seventy four percent the Kings for game number four, but. You can only play the game that's in front of you. Did the Oilers play well? Not really. No, they generated some decent looks. They they didn't get massacred as badly on expected goals as they did on scoring chances. But in a game like this, where you didn't have a ton of power play opportunities, in a game like this, where your one goal really, really, I don't want to say you shouldn't have got it or... It was fluky or unfair. Or I I want to contextualize it because it feels kind of cheap to win a game one nothing, where your only goal came on the power play, especially in a series that's largely been defined by special teams. And the Oilers deserve some credit for finding a way to win a game like this because it wasn't pretty. In fact, it was pretty ugly in all honesty. They didn't play particularly well. But they found a way to win a game in a style that they haven't done a whole lot in any iteration of the Connor McDavid Oilers. You're never going to. The Oilers are not built to be a defense first team. So the fact they were able to win tonight largely on their goaltending, that deserves some credit. Because Stuart Skinner had a hard job tonight. I, excuse me if you hear some clicks on my mouse. I'm pulling up the box scores now. I mean. 71 to 34 in scoring chances, 33 to 12 in shots on goal, 14 to 4 in high danger, and then 3 to 1 in expected goals. I mean, that's about as thorough a domination as you get. And the Kings did a great job defensively by forcing the Oilers to play defense. It's not that it's not that the Kings were doing a masterful job of stopping the Oilers at the blue line, holding them to poor scoring chances. The Kings would hold the puck in the offensive zone a minute at a time. The Oilers defense had a really hard time clearing the zone in this game and it made it really challenging for the Oilers to be able to build up any type of sustained offense and that's why, you know, it's not exactly a surprise the Oilers' one goal came on the power play. If you were watching the broadcast, you heard the stat. They've scored on 8 of 15 power plays in this series. That's going to win you a lot of free and hockey games if you're able to convert at that high of a rate. But coming up next on Locked on Oilers, we're going to dive a little bit more into Stuart Skinner, a little bit of a conversation about goaltending, building off of some thoughts I developed over the weekend. Coming up next on Locked on Oilers, where we've got your team covered every day. We are in the thick of it, sports fans. We got the basketball playoffs. We got the hockey playoffs, baseball season in full swing. The draft was over the weekend. We've got motorsports, NASCAR, and Formula One rolling. It's time to get in on the action over at FanDuel. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks to pole positions, all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And by our friends over at Game Time. If you're watching this on Monday morning, you're watching this sometime during the day on Monday, part of the reason my eyes are at 
my allergies are jacking up my eyes so much is I spent my Sunday afternoon at City Field watching the Mets play baseball, saw them win on a walk-off home run. It was the first nice warm day of spring in New York today on Sunday and forgot about my allergies. So my eyes, I've been in in an allergy-induced blender all day, but I got my tickets to the game for me, my friends, his dad, over on Game Time, the only app I use to buy tickets. What makes Game Time so special? It's real straightforward, all in pricing. There's no surprise fees when you get to that final page. You tap through, you feel like you got a good deal, and there's another fifty to a hundred dollars on there. Game Time, all in pricing. When you tap, the price you see once you put your tickets in your cart is the price you pay. Number two, the digital rendering of the view from your seat. When you're browsing through the various sections, you can click, you can click. It will pull up a digital view of what the event, game, etc. looks like from the seat you would clicked on. So you get an idea of sight lines, if there's any obstructions, if you can or can't see the scoreboard, all of that good stuff. And last minute deals, flash deals, and zone deals for specialized things. Last minute deals, if you're in the area right before the game starts zone deals where if you don't particularly care what row or seat you're in and so much more take the guessworks out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account and use code locked on nhl for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account and redeem code l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-n-h-l for 20 dollars off Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I want to thank everybody who's listening to this Monday edition of Locked on Oilers, where we've got the Oilers covered every day. Oilers taking a 3-1 series lead on a 1-0 win, largely due to the superb performance of goaltender Stuart Skinner. And when you are a goalie like Stuart Skinner, when you are somebody who people are skeptical of when you are somebody who when you are someone who is viewed as a product of your environment as opposed to somebody who is molding the environment around them to quote jack nicholson in in the departed you are always going to be second guessed you are always going to be minimized you are never going to get the amount of credit you deserve and you're never going to get a fair share of the blame I know I, in particular, was a little bit hard on Skinner based on the game the King, the uh, Oilers had lost, Game 2, up in Edmonton, where I didn't feel like he had his best game. But you heard me contextualize it a little bit on the show we did right after that game, where, yes, he did not play well, but, and there are two levels to this, so stick with me. Number one, goaltending is very volatile. It is very environment-induced. There is only so much you can do as a goaltender. Even if you're playing well, you can have you can lose a hockey game where your goalie plays really well by an ugly score. You can lose a hockey game four to one, five to two, in a game where your goalie had some amazing saves. But sometimes you get the bad bounces. Sometimes you don't. Your defense doesn't do your goalie any favors. And then number two, and I think this is something that I that drives me crazy in the playoffs, and we can extend this past goalies, you know, star players get this. I'm sure Alex Ovechkin's going to get this because the Capitals were eliminated. Mitch Marner's already starting to get this, and the Leafs haven't been eliminated. When you start to single guys out, it feels a little bit more of a personal attack. It feels like you are questioning their worth as a person because we've so inherently tied success to being good in society that in sports if you win a lot you can be a terrible person but because you win in sports you're deified and it's really unfortunate because the other end of that spectrum is what happens to guys like Stuart Skinner like Mitch Marner like Ilya Samsonov where you tried your best and that's something that irks me to no end when people who know better when people in media, especially the people who played, that's why I dislike a lot of the talking head panels on the sports shows, very, whatever sport they're talking about. Cause when they start bringing up things like questioning people's effort, their commitment to the game, if they're trying, all of that is so inherently disrespectful to assume you can understand what another person is doing. Someone you probably haven't met, someone you haven't talked to, or even worse, when you do it to people you do know and it comes off two-faced and fugazi, to 
crap on a guy on a panel for intermission and then have him on your show and oh buddy buddy it, it just seems so for contrived and forced and that we're always looking for the easy answer the, the problem at hand here in this conversation and something i bring up a lot there is so much randomness in hockey. It makes us uncomfortable. We all think we understand the game. We all think we know the game. We all think we do a good enough job in our understanding of the game that we can explain why things happen, why things don't happen. When in reality, because hockey has so many variables in every given play, it is always going to be a challenge to get a reasonable and a full picture. I think that's the biggest issue and was something I really struggle with at times in myself in my evaluations of players or teams is I'm never going to be able to know everything. There, There's just not, we do not have as good of an understanding of the game as we would need to do that, both in terms of statistics, both in terms of tactics and strategy. Because hockey is a little bit behind the other sports, we haven't gotten to that efficiency in distribution of information and ideas to the point where there is a deeper community. Don't get me wrong. The hockey analytics community, the hockey education community, they do great jobs. There are so many important creators and yeah, I'll, I'll say creators and journalists who do important work in growing that understanding, fostering that understanding and helping empower fans to be smarter. But it feels stupid to reduce a lot of teams' playoff woes to, well, the goalie didn't make the saves, that's the game, that's the series. It feels way too simplistic and way too unsatisfactory to somebody who's as curious as I am. Putting the blame on the goalie is very rudimentary and really, it's just, it's lazy. Yeah, did Stuart Skinner play well in game two when they lost? No. He didn't. He told you himself. He said there were one or two of those goals he would have liked to have had back. I can accept that. I also know that that's not a moral failing on who Stuart Skinner is as a person. I know he knows he needs to be better. Complaining about it, singling him out, that doesn't do anything positive. You're trying to get your goalie in a good headspace. It was really encouraging to see Skinner play as well as he did. A couple really nice saves down the stretch in that third period for the Oilers to win them that game. And his team picked him up. That is an integral component of any team that's going to go on a long playoff run that hopefully doesn't end until the end of June. You need to be able to win in a variety of different games you need different players to step up at different times, and you need your players to pick each other up depending on the game. Skinner's not going to be great the rest of the way. He might have good games. He might have bad games. Maybe he's going to go on a heater. Maybe he's going to win, you know, five of his next seven starts, and his save percentage is going to be like 915, 920. Oilers then? The rest of their team, that unlocks some stuff. That raises their ceiling as a team. But being that goaltending, being that Skinner are what they are, you're more likely going to have a little bit more of an up and down as opposed to a linear, positive, good feeling the entire way just because things change so fast. And coming up next, we're going to talk about Stuart Skinner a little bit more, two other stars of the game, set the table for game number four, coming up next on Locked On Oilers, where we've got your team covered every day. All right, game off. We got to pause here to talk about Monopoly Go. I know what you're saying. The lay of game. You've already talked about that. But there's so much good stuff in this game. In Monopoly Go, you can team up with friends for time tournaments where you work together to build up each other's boards. The more you win together, the more awesome prizes you unlock. And there's so much to get. Unique stickers you can trade with friends to complete albums for big prizes. Cool new pieces to travel the boards playing as. Hilarious emojis for taunting friends when you smash their buildings or heist their vaults. Plus, Monopoly Go feels new and exciting every day with constantly changing tournaments and challenges. A ton include their own unique mini games like Digging for Treasure or a robot pachinko machine, and there's always new timed events that help you win big, like massive multipliers for everything you win or rent frenzies. 
There's always something fun to discover in Monopoly Go, so get off the bench and go download it now free on Google Play or the app. App Store, game on. And thank you so much to everybody who is starting off their Monday with Locked On Oilers. I know I am tired on my Monday morning. I don't want to talk to anyone. I am often overtired from actually enjoying my weekends because if you're not having fun on your weekends and you're working Monday to Friday, when are you supposed to have fun? So I am very tired. The bags under my eyes, if you're watching on YouTube, are both from allergies and exhaustion. I worked the NFL drafts Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I uh, went to the Met game Sunday. I am tired. I can't wait to go to bed. It was a real struggle to stay awake during the Oilers-Kings game right before recording this. I was falling asleep, but drank about half a gallon of water over the course of the third period to keep myself awake. And here I am, very happy that the Oilers are on the precipice now. The Oilers' talent disparity is real. They are significantly more talented than the Kings when we're talking about talent as a tangible asset. You know, if you were to take, if you were to get the uh, the basketball from Space Jam and you were to have Connor McDavid and Leon and everybody on the Oilers to touch the basketball and their talent got sucked up into it, there would be more talent in there than there would be in the Kings' equivalent basketball. The Oilers' high-end guys have dominated this series. The Kings' special teams have not been there. And I know the vast majority of the game is played at 5-on-5, and you you always hear me in particular talk, cite that stat, that 80% of the game or more is played at 5-on-5 on average. And if you're going to try and win as the underdog, you need to lighten up. You need to tighten up on your special teams. And... I understand the Oilers' power play is great. It is. It's one of the best we've seen consistently. It's been top five for the better part of the last five years. I believe it was number two or number three this season in the regular season. I don't remember off the top of my head. That's bad. bad job out of me, but riffing off the top of my head here. When you're playing a team that has a power play that's that good, you got to be you got to be smarter. And I know the Kings did a good job. They didn't take a lot of penalties in this game in relation, in comparison to the other ones in this series, but man, you just knew that was going to swing the game and you give the Oilers an inch. They're going to take a mile because that's what good teams do. That's what teams with talent do. You give Connor McDavid enough chances to make something happen. He's going to do it. And I know they didn't give him a ton tonight. I thought the Kings did a great job defensively at five on five. The amount of block shots, the amount of. There were just no opportunities. The Oilers regained the zone and nothing was going on. They couldn't get through to the net front and it was a real challenge. But. For the third segment after an Oilers win in the playoffs, we've been highlighting individual performances. So we'll start at the top. We'll start with our first star of the game. Stuart Skinner was outstanding tonight. Anytime you pitch a shutout in the playoffs, you deserve kudos. Now, there are different types of playoff shutouts. There are the Marty Brodeur 1999 14 save shutouts, which don't deserve as much credit as they get. And then there are efforts like tonight where you look down the barrel of 70 scoring chances and you don't concede a single goal. Stuart Skinner should feel really good about himself. I'm happy that he got to have that performance as a person because I know he definitely wasn't feeling great about his game. His numbers coming into this game were not great, both for this series and his playoff stats at large. So... You get that individual performance in one game. And I know it's only one game, but in an ideal world, you get that in Skinner's head that, okay, I can be an effective part of the series. I can help my team win. That's how we start building up a mindset, getting him into, uh, okay, I'm in a good place. I'm ready to attack this next game. Let's eliminate them in five and let's get ourselves set up for round two. You've got Skinner in the game now he was fighting it he looked really comfortable tonight there were a few rebounds that were a little anxiety inducing for the lack of a better word but he played well enough on sunday night and they won and they won a shutout i almost said shootout i am tired excuse me evan bouchard you score a goal in a one nothing game you're a star of the game 
Bouchard is interesting to me in that he fits the archetype of the modern offensive right-handed defenseman who is strong offensively, who's a good skater, has really good puck instincts, is reasonably sized, but doesn't play to his size. Evan Bouchard is very good, but he's not physical, even though he's on the he's a little bit above NHL average in terms of size. You would like him to be a little bit better defensively, but his emergence this year as a genuine top five to 10 defenseman in the NHL has been invaluable and it's unlocked another tier for the Oilers this year, scoring a goal. Anytime you can do that in a playoff game in a one, nothing game, it's important. And then in true mean girls fashion, I would like Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl to crack the third star in half for both getting an assist on the goal for Bouchard. Um, You've heard me talk about this a lot, and I've only been doing this show for like a week and a half at this point, but watching Connor McDavid facilitate the power play is just awe-inspiring. Because again, and I made this comparison, it's so similar to a point guard in basketball, a ball-dominant point guard in basketball, who drives to the basket and then pulls defenders towards him and then has the kick out. And that play... The goal that happens, the Bouchard goal happens because McDavid brings guys to him and opens up space. Yes, Leon makes a great pass there too. The interplay those three have on this power play is insane. There are a handful of teams in the entire league that can match that firepower one, two, three. And the teams that match it don't exactly match it in the exact same way. Like, sure, maybe on a talent level, you could argue Colorado's one, two, three is better, but. The way Edmonton uses those guys to set up the other pieces out there, it is just so satisfying to watch. And the Oilers power play is just, it is such a treat to watch them make plays, especially in a game like this where you needed one. And that's what's, and that's what I'll wrap up this episode on. I opened on the idea that the Oilers were in a position where they were going to need to find ways to win in a variety of different ways over the course of a long playoff run. They showed you they can do the high scoring. Last night, Sunday night, that was the hold on to your butts. Our goalie can win us a game if we need him to. I'm not saying he's going to be able to do that again, even one more time, but it is possible. And having that possibility in your toolbox does good things for your team's confidence. Finding a way to win in a variety of different ways is important, and it helps you be prepared no matter who you're playing or what the situation is. But that will just about do it for this Monday edition of Locked on Oilers. Make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts. Leave the show a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you're watching over on YouTube, yes, the bags are getting worse. I'm sorry. There is only oh so much I can do. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Hit the alarm bell so you get a notification whenever a new episode goes live. And leave us a comment. What do you think is the key to the Oilers finishing this series in five games? I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Until then, let's go Oilers.